Hi, thank you very much for turning back in. My name is Fonny. In my channel, I talk about my houseplant and my Hoyas. Today, it is a topic that I wanted to create since a while ago, but it takes some time for me to collect some of the questions. So today's topic is answering all of your questions that I have asked you to provide me. I often find this uh, Q&A section that other people are recording to be very interesting because this allow us to interact a little bit more and also give me input of what kind of information you will be interested to know. And I have posted a question on Instagram and also on YouTube community tab. If you would like to join next time asking questions or something that you would like to discuss, that would be incredibly helpful for everyone to learn from each other. Now, I really appreciate uh, those who sent in questions and I have listed out who has posted this question and also what is the specific question. And I also think all of these questions are very interesting. If you are interested in this type of content and you would like to support me producing similar videos, don't forget to hit that like button and share this video with your friends. If you have not subscribed to my channel yet and you find this interesting, don't forget to hit that subscribe button before you move on. Now start off with the first question that I have. This is from Matt. Hi Fonny, which Hoya surprised you with the most growth or blooms of this year? So I have marked down all of the answer in my notebook um, to answer your question. The most surprised growth for me in the past year would be Hoya Exilis and Hoya Leucantha. Hoya Leucantha is one of the Hoya species from Papua that is published um, last year in 2022. The reason why um, I really find these ones surprising me is because at the time when it arrived, it actually shriveled pretty uh, intensely. You can see the reference that I'm showing you right now. The leaves are very, very thin and also it looks super dried at the time when I unboxed it uh, from LB Gardens uh, import. But um, it surprised me from how quick it actually reacclimate and also rejuvenile. I believe this is because of the thin leaf nature. It really needs to be in a constant moist uh, substrate. And because it has been in the parcel back then for seven to eight days, it took it quite a bit of a hit. So my cat tips of this one in my past six months of experience, as long as you keep the substrate moist, I will use um, the DIY self-watering pot that I have. You can also check out my video, how to make them in a more budgeted way. It actually thrives. It grows so many new leaves over just, I think just within like three weeks, no, just within like three months, it actually doubled the size. Both of Hoya Exilis and Hoya Leucantha, at the time when I received it, their size are pretty similar. I almost found or thought them to be the same plant, until Hoya Exilis actually bloomed. That was the time when I confirmed that this is Hoya Exilis. And you can also check out the video that I have showing you my experience with Hoya Exilis blooming process. It is very beautiful when it comes to the delicate, almost like glass look of this uh, flower itself. It's kind of translucent, but at the same time, it has a kind of pearly shine on the corolla. And with regard to Hoya leucantha, it is very similar with regard to the texture. And it also explains why they are both my surprising Hoya in their growth. Because this one literally has three times doubled or tripled the size. And I'm very, very excited. Um, hopefully one day I can also see the flower from Hoya leucantha. I have saw pictures of the flower. It's very thin. Um, the corolla is very thin. Also, the coloration is very mild. Both the corona and corolla has similar coloration, so you can't really tell the difference, and it's not very contrasty when it comes to the flower. Um, combination between Corolla and Corona. But still, it is a very delicate, thin pedicel. And also this entire umbel looks very delicate. That is very easy to be broken. So I look very forward for the growth of the flowering. 
Then we move on to the second part of Matt's question is the most surprising room that I have. It's several of them, I can't really pick one, but it will be probably helpful for any one of you who would like to have an early flowering experience in your Hoya collection, I would say is Hoya Flagellata. Hoya Flagellata, I got it from RCM Plant Export as a import maybe seven, eight months ago. The most impressive thing about Flagellata is that it never stopped blooming once it has start pushing out a peduncle in my experience and it often bloom um, at the time when it blooms it lasts probably for five days it's not a very long flower duration it just keep pushing out new flowers so it wouldn't really have a break the sun is a little bit uh, intense at the moment so i'm just going to move a little bit so if you check out my video uh for hoya flower bloom series of flagellata you can see how my experience is like with flagellata and the fun part about flagellata is it never stopped blooming once it starts pushing out the first peduncle it just keep pushing out new peduncle over and over and over again and the interesting part about flagellata is it has very long um, tendrils it doesn't have to have so many leaves on the tendril the peduncle actually grow in the very end of the very long vine, which is a little bit annoying in my opinion because you can't really cut it. You feel like you're losing a chance of having a flower forming there. But all in all, this never stopped blooming for me ever since I created that flower blooming series for flagellata. The second one is a very similar texture perspective. Also, the flower is quite similar. That is Hoya fluensis. Hoya fluensis was not an easy one for me when I started acclimating it. At the time when I received from Ossian Plant Export, it arrives pretty nice, but then it took a very long time for it to root and rehab. But once it has developed uh, mature roots, it then start pushing out peduncle. And once the peduncle has pushed out, it never stopped pushing out new peduncle or flowers on the existing spur. So in that perspective, it has actually never stopped blooming for me. One of the thing about Fuarensis is it normally will open up in night time or very close to the morning time. So if you want to see it fully opened, I would say you have to stay up for a little bit longer in order to see when it fully open up. And it will start opening back up um, around maybe 7 or 8 p.m. in my experience. Of course, I put this one in my meals bow cabinet. It doesn't really yeah, I really don't know how they actually noted about the change of the light situation. Maybe it's the temperature, because that's the only thing. Or maybe that's the time when I switch off my light in my meals bow cabinet. Leave a comment down below how you can tweak the hours of flower opening for Fuwa Ensis. Next question is from the plant tower. What will you do when all your Hoyas grow bigger, move to a bigger apartment? Well, thank you very much for this question. I constantly got asked the same question from my boyfriend because I have been expanding my Hoya collection quite a lot, even during the winter time. As you could tell, I have three unboxing that, or maybe two, unboxing that I have released uh, since I posted this video. So yeah, I guess there is a way. I'm going to share a little bit more. I have my notes over here. Well. I would say buying a larger space is my ultimate goal, but a lot of us can't really move to have more space, isn't it? So what I would do is actually reorganizing what I have at the moment. So if you can see, I can show you my meal spoke cabinet on the side. Um, I would arrange my current Mealsbow cabinet in a better way. You can see that in the Mealsbow cabinet, it has different layers. On each level, I actually have three separate layers. So then instead of having um, kind of horizontal um, height of all of the plant, I actually stack up these transparent acrylic stand, which almost look non-existent. And I will kind of have it level up. So then from the front view, it is pretty good looking. It's almost looks like a 
square wall, but actually it's not stacked on a wall. It is actually on uh, individual uh, cups, um, or I would say individual DIY pots that I have showed you. And then I have it stacked um, level by level. So the benefit for this one is I can easily water them. Um, I can see the water reservoir instead of like everything is covering up uh, the front Hoya covered the behind one, the Hoya behind it. So then I can't really tell whether the water reservoir is empty or not. So in this way, from stacking it up step uh, by steps, it allow me to have a better overview of how the water re reservoir looks like. And another thing is use smaller pots. The second tips here, I know a lot of people will say that, well, Hoya doesn't really like to be in smaller pots because root bound is not good for most of the Hoyas. I understand your point and I totally agree with you. If I have the space, I would love to have a bigger pot size. And I do find that Hoya do grow larger um, if the pot is slightly larger. But as you have, as some of you might have followed me for period of time, you know that I mostly use six centimeters pots only, and those pots are perfectly fit in my Milsbo cabinet. Because of the pot being very small, I have a lot of pots available on each level. I think based on my rough estimation, each level at least has 30 to 36 pots in one level only. And this is incredible because this also means that just in my small Nielsbo cabinet, it already have more than a hundred species within that small, tiny space. So this is my second tips is to use smaller pots. And of course, smaller pots, I only use it for um, cuttings. So I have most of my Hoyas grown from a cutting. And when there is no roots in the cutting, it doesn't really work if it is a really large pot. So normally, if it is a cutting, if the leaves aren't enormously large, and particularly I mostly like small leaf Hoyas, it fits very well. And then all of the Hoyas are very happy uh, in the smaller sized pot uh, because the leaves are small, the system and the stem size, it's very small as well. But obviously I also do repotting. If I found that the water reservoir is like seriously overcrowded, I will pot it in a larger pot with Lechuza Pond. Um, I also have another trick uh, in order to increase the water reservoir is using the same small tiny pot, but having a larger uh, cup to replace the existing smaller pot. You can check out my DIY self-watering pot again um, if you want to know what kind of tricks I have done for that part. And the third tips to have a larger Hoya collection but with limited space is to start with cuttings. This is also really fun um, and also this is something that you can kind of prevent a uh, pest um, or I would say prevent bringing a large amount of pest that you don't really know it existed from the garden center. So starting with the cutting you only have the size like this. First of all, I think it's very fun because you see it grow, starting with the root in the stem and then it pushed out new stem and then it pushed out more and more branches. This is such a joy for me uh, in my experience to have this opportunity to see a Hoya grow from just a small cutting. So start as a cutting. You could definitely slow down <laughs> your speed of expansion. And the last tips that I have, it may not apply to all of you because different people will have different preferences, but is to start with small and medium size leaves, Hoya. Um, right, uh, medium size, I would say it's around like this, this size, I would say that is medium and small size is like, like tiny, just like your nail size, then I will define it as small leaf Hoya. Yeah, that's how I managed to put in more than a hundred species in my tiny Mealspo cabinet, just because I have small pots, I have the leveling up, and I have the smaller leaf size. Um, and also I start as a cutting. So these are the four <laughs> principle that I have um, in order to have a large collection, but limited space. I hope this helped and I hope this gives you a little bit of idea. You have such strong desire to have more Hoyas, but how could you do that with very limited space? 
Let me know in the comment box below if you have more tips that you would like to share with all of us. Your tips in expanding Hoya collection with limited space. Next question from Anna. What's your watering schedule with so many plants? I constantly ask myself the same question as well, especially now that everyone, well, at least most of us around the world are available to travel again. You don't really have the time to water your plants and have a fixed schedule like every seven day and well that means you can't travel that means you have to have a plant friend that come to your home and water all of your plants this question is specifically relevant to people who have more than hundreds of plants i guess but there are several tips that i would like to share with you so then potentially even if you have say 10 plants or you have 200 plants these could also be some tips for you to resolve this question or this problem so first off before even digging into this question what does your plant need it is very important for you to observe because Watering schedule highly depend on the environment that you're providing to the plant themselves. Different plants will have different um, favorable terms over water. Some types of plants need to be watered all the time so then you can keep the soil substrate constantly moist. Or for some ferns, they even like to have almost soggy, wet um, substrate so then you won't risk browning on the tips of fern and some of the other plants could be like monstera it will be very upset if you have soggy wet substrate it likes to be moist but also it needs to be airy in the soil substrate so in order to determine this watering schedule you really have to observe depending on different season depending on the temperature even depending on the humidity and most importantly it depends on the light many of us may have grow light so in fact even if it is in winter months if you have a grow tent if you have a dedicated spot with a lot of grow light that locates in the same place over 365 days it may not differ so much between winter months and summer months so i would say in that perspective, you really need to answer that question by yourself through observing. Now, a lot of the plant that I have, including different kinds that I have covered, Monstera, those ones suppose not liking soggy wet substrate. Ferns, they like to be relatively moist most of the time in the soil substrate. Hoyas, they really don't like to be... Um, soggy wet i would say in the soil substrate except say hoyabella they may like to have a more moist soil substrate all of them i applied one rule and it's relatively easy because i only use lechuza pond you can check out my lechuza pond uh, video explaining different um, ideas or different opinion and also explaining a little bit of the choice that I made uh, behind. You can check out that video, but in this occasion, I would just like to tell you, for me, it's very simple. I only use Lechuza Pond. Of course, you can tweak the Lechuza Pond a little bit, um, adding some additional inorganic substrate to increase the moist uh, holding ability or increase the airiness. For example, you add some really large perlite to make it more airy. So this kind of adjustment, you could do it by yourself, but for me, I only use the choose upon. The good thing about that is I know the plant will be constantly moist over time. And I also feel very comfortable and I feel much more clean using the choose upon because these, these are just like small little rocks. It, it kind of looks nice. I like how it looks like. So that's my top um, approach. Uh, that's my top tips. In my experience, because I have so many plants, the second tips I have is to use self-watering pots. Of course, for larger plant, all of them, in my experience, I use the choose a planter because they look really nice. They are using the same system and they are available uh, in where I am. So you can check out the Lechuza planter uh, video if you want to check out more on what type of Lechuza planters I have. But 
The second tip, as I have mentioned here, is the self-watering functionality. Once you have the self-watering ability, you not necessarily need to have this watering schedule because all you need to do is to observe how much water reservoir it has left. It is also much easier for your friend if they're coming to your home to help you watering them because all they need to look at is the indicator. If it is fully dried up, yeah, add more water. If it is not, then they just leave it alone. Of course, this one really depends on the water root growth um, pattern. If there is already water roots, then you can fully rely on the water reservoir. But if there's no water root in the watering system, then you will have to just water it like a normal sort of substrate. Now, further of these explanation, I have it in the uh, Le Choose a Pom uh, video. And of course, if you have more questions that you want to follow up, you can leave your comment down below and I can try to answer your question based on my experience. But yeah, the second tip would be using a self-watering pot. I also have the DIY self-watering pot that I have shared with you that save a lot of my money because for smaller plant like Hoyas, I don't use Latrusa planter because it is way too big for my small little plants. Now, the third tip is to have a brief understanding of all of the plant's uh, watering cycle. I would say, even though I don't specifically have a very rigid date, like every seven day water all of my plant, of course it depends on tip one is to observe, but I do have an idea. For example, I know that in summer months, most of my plants will dry up much quicker because I rely a lot on my south facing window and the heat is also really hot. It also encourage a lot of evaporation of the moisture in the soil substrate. So in summertime, I would say even five days, every five days, I have to water my plants. Seven day could be a stretch for ferns. Um, so those ones are the small tweaks that you could have. And in winter months, I know that because it's really cold, it doesn't really evaporate uh, as quick as in summer and spring month. So I know that on average, I only need to water every, well, I would say 10 to 14 days. So the third tip is really to develop this expectation, that um, concept of when you should check your plant. Um, and this schedule is not rigid. This depends on the first tip, observation. And then it moves on to how you create this expectation for yourself. Every five days in summer months, you check a little bit every 10 to 14 days, you check a little bit in winter and autumn months. Another thing that I also want to show you is a huge benefit for me in watering. That is the pumpable water tank. I really, really appreciate this invention because it significantly reduced the time I need to water a hundred plus plant inside my Nielsbo cabinet. I'm going to show you and demonstrate what I use and how I use it. I first saw this one in several YouTube videos from the different plant collectors. In particular, this one, it's um, five liter. And the reason why this one I highly recommend it is because it significantly saved my time when it comes to the amount of time I need to water my plants. As you can see over here, I have basically more than maybe a hundred small tiny plants inside here and if i need to refill my bottle every single time it's going to take hours to get this done however this one significantly reduced the time i need to water all of my plants at least inside this millspo cabinet because as you can see i have these ones this is another tips that i want to share is that i have this small tiny reservoir it could actually last for seven to ten days in my experience and it definitely reduce the probability of you kind of miswatering your plant, underwatering your plant, and then turned out the plant will kind of suffer because of um, lack of water for a longer period of time. 
and also this one is shared with you in my another video how I made these um, DIY planters, um, self-watering planters. So it wouldn't cost too much money if you find all of these materials. You don't need to find exactly the same materials as I showed you, but something similar so then you can apply the same concept would be sufficient. So then you see here, these are water reservoir that has been watered around seven days ago. And now I'm going to um, show you how I water my plants using this one. And this is only for the purpose of showing you because if you see that the water reservoir level is still half, I would say you don't have to water these ones until it is completely dried um, or maybe a little bit moist, um, but all dried up. On the bottom reservoir. This one I would say is a little bit um, too long because the roots has started to dry a little tiny bit but um, it's still alive because you can see the roots are still very um, white or yellowish off-white color. But uh, this is the stage where I would say water uh, your plant and fill up the water reservoir. So now you can see I'm using this one. The reason why it's super convenient and save time is because of this very long hose um, that could actually get all the way into the furthest plant in the very end side instead of kind of kind of messing around and then you kind of um, have the risk of pulling over different plants if you do not have this very long hose. And if you see what I do here, it's just to water the reservoir and it really takes no time and I really like how this one is watered because as you can see the water is very small tiny drops just like there and with this the water can emerge into the little rocks very effectively and instead of like rocking and then ended up just have a clotted of water on the very top but then it didn't go into the water reservoir so as you can see it only takes maybe two seconds to fill up the pot and you can't imagine how useful this one is if you ask me this whole cabinet before having this very useful equipment it takes me around oh i mean maybe an hour if i'm efficient enough to water all of the four levels of plant inside my meal spell cabinet but you can do the maths if this one takes around two seconds to fill up the water reservoir it takes maybe less than 30 minutes for me to water all of the plant and um this is how easy it is. And the reason why I have this towel at the moment is just to capture some of the excessive water that gets out. So then I won't risk um, rusting my Mealsbo cabinet. And normally after I have watered with this um, pumping waterer, I will open my Mealsbo cabinet for probably around 30 minutes just to let the excessive um, moist that is larger droplet um, escape and evaporate from the meal smoke cabinet so then I could reduce the probability of rusting the frame and as far as I've done this for more than a year now um, the meal smoke cabinet is still not having any significant rusting problem so I highly, highly recommend this one when it comes to watering tips. I hope these tips will help you out if you have a lot of hoyas or other philodendron, monstera, ferns that could help you out in your watering schedule, especially when you are traveling. And then another question from D Garden. In your experience, which hoya is the hardest to flower? Well, I have a lot of Hoyas and I actually haven't flowered most of them. I am very happy that I got the opportunity to see more than maybe 20, 30 Hoya species flowering, but I do have one 
sets of Hoya that I find and I also heard that is really difficult to flower, which is Hoya Lautabarkii. And I also noted that Lautabarkii is not necessarily a Hoya, but it is an Eristemma. And particularly for that type of Hoya, um, it is the, the flower, it's like this size, I guess. It's, it's like maybe like this size. And I heard that in order to flower uh, Eristemma, flower, which i.e. many of us also indicate Lautabarkii as a Hoya, is they need extremely high light, extremely humid uh, environment for it to actually have the potential to push out flower. And at the same time, um, it also requires it to be very mature, like a super long stem. Uh, for example, the tendril will grow all the way to like two meters and then it will start pushing out the donkel. And essentially it is because of the natural habitat it is coming, it has came from, is that it grows in large trees. It actually needs to go all around uh, the tree stem and go all the way to the top uh, and reach direct sunlight to have this type of um, environment that encourages to grow. I also encounter a pretty difficult time to acclimate it. Um, the first time when I have imported it from LB Garden, it didn't make it. It unfortunately died um, after, I think after two months, or no, after two weeks. But then the second time when I imported it from LB Garden, it managed to grow and I am happy that it is growing constantly both outside uh, my meal spell cabinet in my normal room environment, just like what you look at and what you see right now. And I also managed to um, provide environment for it to grow within the meal spell cabinet. It receives very high light. Um, it is right underneath my grow light. And particularly the growth pattern is just vertical. So it just reaches closer and closer to my uh, grow light. So yeah, I think uh, in that perspective, Hoya slash Erostemma Lautabarkii is the hardest Hoya in my collection that potentially I may not see it grow a flower. Next question is from Night Plants. How many Hoyas do you have? Uh, I think I actually started off keeping track with my Hoya because I wanted to label them. Um, so I have created this Excel sheet indicating what Hoyas I have and when I obtained it. In that practice that I have done, I think I have more than 200 Hoyas that I am currently owning. And uh, yeah, I think it is also a tip for any one of you who have quite a number of Hoya. I remember when I started collecting Hoya, I never feel the urge to have any of labeling because I will remember it uh, because I mostly remember most of the things that I do and keep. So I didn't really uh, do any record. But ever since I have collecting over maybe a hundred Hoyas, particularly for Hoyas only with a session number. It is not an easy job to remember. For example, NS050015, or that's the affinity of Megalentha, um, Hoya GPS 7240, it is Istanbulans. No, that is actually GPS 735. Look, already mixed up. So this is something that I really wanted to have a systematic way to keep track of. And I also saw Camilla doing that at the time when I was visiting her Hoya Garden, Hoya Paradise in Sweden. So I found this one to be very, very helpful. Um, I marked uh, all of my Hoyas. Um, I also create this transparent slip uh, or transparent indicator. And then I have a golden pen to mark down the name and have it inserted in all of my Hoyas. Uh, currently still in progress doing that for my Hoyas in my uh, living room. All of those in the Millsburg cabinet has this little tag now, but yeah. The short answer is 205 and keep growing. I just recently placed an order from Hoya Passion at 12, maybe 220. I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, there you go. And then the next question from Helen. What was the first plant you purchased? Do you still have it? I do remember the first plant since I started my plant journey maybe four and a half years ago. That is a peace lily that I got from Ikea. 
I do not have it now um, because at the time when I was moving between apartments, this piece lily that I got from IKEA has probably tripled the size. I place it in a very low light environment and no wonder there's no flower pushing out after I have purchased it, um, but it has grown enormously large. What I did is I sold it. I sold it in the plant community, or I would say an online platform. I can show you, uh, and you can also see uh, in the reference uh, how it looks like when I sold it. It's enormous. And I am glad that I sold it to a person that will have the space to take care of the piece lay. But I really think it's a great starter plant because the only one thing that they need is water. They will tell you immediately if you underwater it because all of the leaves will look like this. And it's so satisfying because if it is not so badly dried up, it will go back within a night. So over a night, um, it will change significantly and it will tell you, thank you very much. Now I have enough water. So it is a really nice one, uh, the Peace Lily. Another question is from AB. How do you feel about all flat mite panic that's going on in the Hoya community right now? Ah, oh, such a great question, because I also asked the same question to Camilla and Emily when I visited them in Sweden. I, in my opinion, I think some of my Hoyas do have um, flat mites because some of them just never really push out new growth for a very long time, like a year time. However, I really hesitated to do too much about flat mites because if the situation is not so bad what means by so bad is all of my hoises are not growing then i would consider it as very very bad and i have to do something to address it but to be honest um ever since i'm collecting hoyas i never experienced a time when all of my hoya dying and for that being said i am hesitant to do too much to kind of improve the growth of my Hoyas. So my short answer is I don't do anything. I don't boil my Hoyas. Um, I don't do sulfur treatment. I don't really spray anything that I saw online um, to increase the growth. Not that I don't believe these things work, just that it's too much work and I, always have the feeling of the more that you do to make your plant happier not necessarily mean that they will end up happier most of the time i feel like it could deteriorate their growth i can explain a little bit on why i don't use the hot uh, bath uh, method it's because it's just impossible when i have so many plants in le choose upon you have to understand the choose upon has um pumice pumice will float in water and the other two will sink. Essentially, if I boil them, I will have to destroy most of the roots. And at the same time, I also have so many Hoyas, more than 200, as I have just explained to you. If I have to do that practice, maybe I'll take like a month to do it. And I have to constantly do it um, every couple of weeks. That's I, I think that's how it was supposed to be. Based on that, I just can't do it. Uh, and I also don't want to risk killing my plant because I boil them. So that's why I didn't opt for the hot bath uh, method. It's just don't have time to do that. Second one is the sulfur treatment. I think for the sulfur treatment, most of the people who have experienced that have shared that it is very effective. Um, the reason why I'm not doing it is I don't know where to find it. Yeah, sounds ridiculous, right? I just don't know where to find it in the store, so I didn't do it. And second uh, reason, which is main reason, is I don't really like the, the look of the sulfur residue on top of the leaf, especially when I have very small leaf with very compact growth pattern. I know that I can wash them off, but it's not an easy job to wash all of the sulfur residue on the leaf. So in that perspective, I just don't want myself to regret spraying all of the sulfur on my leaf. And all I need to do is just to wait for new growth and to accept the fact that all of my Hoyas suddenly become splashy leaf Hoyas. Yeah. 
there you go that's the reason why not saying that is not effective just that i am not prepared to see how it looked like after the sulfur treatment so what do i do i do treat my hoyas but in a very mild way i only use neem oil for most of the time i know that neem oil is not very effective when it comes to all uh, of the past particularly the thrips it's not helpful i noticed that it works for mites spider mites um and also i have a spraying session like spraying all of my hoyas in uh, warm uh, water instead of dipping it into a hot bath for a constant amount of time i just use around maybe 42 45 um celsius degree water to just take a quick shower for all of my plant like spray through the leaves and then physically uh, flush out all of these eggs or potential pest that is on my Hoyas or on any of my big plants. I also do this for the philodendron. I recently found there is um, thrips of this one. So I just take this one to the shower and with warm water. Now after one week, I haven't seen anything yet. Normally it works quite well, but I just need to keep doing this every month. But it's not too much of a hassle and I never experience plants to have a bad deterioration. But now I'm going to show you a very horror story of my experience in some of my Hoyas. I mentioned that I mostly use and I only use neem oil. That is true until I have found some of the solution that specifically kill mealybugs. I do have a mealybug situation, never so bad that it kills my plant. It just is disgusting and annoying. And I don't want them to mm, continuously reproduce without me doing anything. So I want to do something to reduce significantly the population of mealybugs. So I managed to find a solution, which is oil um, based instead of having any of the pesticide, as far as I understood in the package. Um, I used that to spray all of my Hoyas. I can show you in the video uh, for your reference and how I do it. It worked. Um, many of the mealybugs actually were gone. But one thing that I'm so silly that I forgot to do, and this is a huge tips for you, is after you have spray anything related to oil base, do not, do not switch on your light, at least for 24 hours. I, for some reason, forgot about that. I just want to turn on the light and I can see my beautiful Hoya inside my Millsbow cabinet. I spray them with this oil and then I have the light on, just like before. What happened is this. I did not see yellowing leaf the day after, not the two days after, but a week after. I start seeing this really bad marks on the leaves and then the leaves start yellowing. I asked Ivy, I ask, why is this happening? And then she told me that, well, probably you didn't give enough time for it to dry up. And then I was like, ding, you're right. I forgot to turn off all of the light and then ended up a lot of the leaf has yellowed up and have this very damaging leaves. I was thinking, are those fungus infection? But then when I looked up online, it's not fungal infection and after I understand the process that I have missed out is I forgot to turn off the light and big tips for you if you do anything oil-based for pest control remember to do it at night or even during the day switch off the light that you have for your plant and if you are using natural light I would highly recommend you to do that after the sun has set. So then after you spray it, at least you give around like eight to nine hours of dark situation for it to drip out. So there you go. Um, that's my opinion with the whole kind of uh, flat mite uh, hassle um, in the community. I, I don't really do anything about the flat mites. I do see some of the plant that is not growing start growing after I have sprayed this uh, mealybug solution. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe you can leave a comment down below. How do you do? Uh, what kind of thing that you spray on top of your um, potential flat mite uh, infestation? What do you do for them? And then the last question from Nina. You have a huge collection of plants and one of my biggest concerns is dealing with pests. 
Do you do any preventative care? And what issues have you come across? And how did you treat them? Thanks. The answer is actually elaborated from the question from Abby. Um, but I could also add one point in the preventative uh, way for me to prevent pest is I always use neem oil. Even if I don't see any pest on the leaf, I don't observe any potential damages from any types of pest. I do spray neem oil regularly, maybe every two to three months. Actually, it's not regular enough, but uh, I do that. And I also, uh, I also shower um, most of my plants uh, on a regular base. Uh, for the big one, like the palm tree over here. Yeah, I did it once a year. Uh, it's not it's not frequent enough, but come on, that one is super huge. Uh, but anyways, I will spray um, the or shower it uh, with the hose. Uh, basically, just the, the shower that I have in the bathroom. And in warm temperature, that's the preventative thing that I do. Same with all of my Hoyas. Um, maybe every three months, I will take all of the Hoyas in my meal flow cabinet and then... Um, wash it off one by one uh, in warm water as i said 30 no 40 to 45 celsius degree just so that the warmth of the water may kill some of the eggs or some of the actual pest themselves so i do that neem oil spray hot slash warm showering for spider mites i will also use an additional uh, spray, which is a solution that I made by myself. It's 95% uh, of alcohol diluted um, in... what did I do? Yeah, I think I diluted the 95% and make it to, say, 50%. I make it quite high um, percentage point uh, for the um, alcohol solution. Um, I will dilute this alcohol solution and then spray on the webbing of the spider mite. But uh, that also comes after a showering because I believe the showering is actually the most effective way to physically remove all of the adult pest. And after that, I let it drip and dry up a little bit more. And then I will spray either neem oil, that is for general pest control. And for spider mite, I will additionally spray the alcohol solution that I dilute to around 50% of concentration of alcohol. Let me know in the comment box below if you have further questions that you would like me to have a second Q&A session. I find this one really interesting and I have done some research. Actually, I do have things, <laughs> not blank sheet, um, to answer some of your question. And uh, I also find it to be more related to a specific questions that you have. So don't hesitate to leave me any questions that you want me to cover in the next Q&A section. If you like the concept of this um, Q&A, um, please like this video and share this video with your friends. So potentially you can answer some of your questions, uh, some of your friends' questions from my video. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, do not wait for another second. Press the subscribe button so you won't miss out next time. Until next time, I wish everyone is having a great day. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.